Six Nations show on OTB Sports Radio. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team, we all belong to the team of us. It's spinning, it's spinning! Can you come on and talk about Ireland's attack shape? It's really exciting. Go on, Ireland! I've never seen a team like Ireland before. We all still think to this day that it's the right call and we're the ones out in the pitch. OTB Sports Radio. All right, you're welcome along to the Six Nations show. Nathan, with you. We are at the midway point of the 2022 Six Nations Championship. Ireland have to wait until Sunday for Italy coming to town. Three o'clock kickoff at the Aviva Stadium. But before that, a double header on Saturday, starting with Grand Slam chasing France, travelling to Murrayfield to take on Scotland at 2.15. And then it is England against Wales at Twickenham on Saturday at 4.45. To look ahead to it all, I'm delighted to be joined by Fiona Hayes. Good afternoon, Fiona. Nathan, how are you? It's a bit cold down here in Cork, but not what? too bad. Did you, did you get a bit of snow? Did you get a bit of snow? Snow, the car was covered this morning. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Liam Toland, how are you? I'm as good as going, Nathan. Any, s- any snow for you? There's plenty of it. Nice blustery Great. wind Great, jeez, you can get no any way. of that. I thought oh, I might yeah. get an old snow day up here in Dublin, but none of it. Uh, it's probably going to be a bit cold, a bit blustery, a bit miserable, I'd imagine, again in Dublin on Sunday for Ireland against Italy. And Liam, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yet again, an Ireland Six Nations game, and we're discussing Johnny Sexton or Joey Carberry. Well, straight off the bat, um, I thought Carberry was phenomenal in Paris. Right. Uh, I, I was on with Joe there a while back, and I thought it was one of the best sporting fixtures that I've ever been at. And to think what he produced uh, against the best team in the world, uh, against the best player in the world in Dupont, uh, and, and in possibly the best rugby ground in the world, with a crowd that were really, really concerned. There was, this, there was an electric atmosphere there of rugby people who knew that the winner of this fixture is deserves to be crowned arguably the best in the world and to think that Carberry has had what 20 minutes rugby an hour's rugby since October and to go into that level and contrast that to the relatively easy ride uh, I say that cautiously uh, with the Ireland victory against against Wales and to come out of that fixture I think Ireland have gained enormously I think Carberry has gained enormously I think the team has gained enormously so if I'm answering the question we obviously have to frame how we're going to frame this Italy Ireland game? Is it the next game up? Is it to is it to continue momentum? Is it to prepare for England? Is it prepare for the championship? In which case we have to win by forty plus points, or is it to prepare for the World Cup? I think all those answers can be accommodated by starting Carberry at the weekend. So, in terms of just pure rugby, because you said there's a lot of other factors there, and there's the financial side of it from the IRFU's point of view, and how seriously they need to take the Six Nations, and there's the building up towards the World Cup. Just purely from a rugby point of view, what do Ireland gain from having Carberry there instead of Sexton on Sunday? A lot. Uh, like Carberry, this will be his second start in the Six Nations. So, like, it's ridiculous to think of how we, he's in the conversation for so many seasons, yet this is he's going to be potentially he's going to be second start, which is considering the importance of the fulcrum position that he's playing in and considering uh, Sexton's age, like, I suppose in answering that again, Nathan, I'd say if Sexton was playing in Paris, would he have squeezed more out of Ireland? I've no doubt he would have. Would that extra couple of percent have brought a victory? It could possibly have brought a victory. But the advantages of having Carberry in Paris and again stacking it up uh, this weekend are huge for, for a million reasons. That doesn't mean he'll, Carberry will be playing against England. It certainly doesn't mean that, but what it does, it means it gives, depending on your halfback partnership again, it gives Carberry another, an actual start. So he'd be leading the team this week. No, he's not the captain, but he'd be re- leading the team in terms of all the functionality of it. That's hugely important. You know, we get to see the players play for 80 minutes, but that week, that build up where the coaches turn around and say, look, you're my man, you need to take ownership. That's hugely important for his maturity as an international elite player. Um, not to mention playing again at that level, not to mention testing himself and getting used to the combinations of what Mike Catt as his attack coach and Andy Farrell as his overall coach is trying to achieve. And really important that the, the, the players around him get to hear his voice and get to hear him controlling it. For so many seasons, for all the obvious reasons, Sexton's voice is dominated. Now we need to share that and players need to hear him take control. And he can only do that by taking pitch time. Starting is the ideal way. Fiona, that's an interesting point that I guess when Joey Carberry went to Paris, while the number 10 is always going to be a leader of sorts, because it was his first Six Nations game, you know, you, you want him to get his job done first and foremost and maybe leave the leadership side of things to some of the more experienced players alongside him. At home, 
against Italy, a game everybody expects Ireland not just to win, but to win well, where they're going to have all the territory, all the possession. Actually, he can bring a different side of himself to that sort of game as well, where Ireland are going to dominate and he can he can find his voice a lot more comfortably, as Lima's saying. A start here for Joey would give him massive confidence. We've seen, you know, we saw him in that French game. He kind of, the second half in particular, I thought, you know, he re-evaluated at half time. He looked at the attack and I thought he came out as a, a, a definitely a player that had gained a bit of confidence. Even though Ireland weren't on the front foot, it was almost like he looked at it and came out and controlled things a lot better in that second half. So something like this going into the Italian game, giving him that start, as Liam said, that, that week in camp where you're pulling the strings, where he He's talking to the guys, be it Casey, whoever's going to partner with him or whoever's who, whatever centres we're going to see in there. It would be just really, really good for him to get this under his belt. Whether it's going to happen, I'm not too sure, but he's definitely the man that should be getting game time in, in, a, in a fixture, particularly like this, because we know we have England ahead of us and we obviously have Scotland and there's a triple crown up for, grab, or a triple crown up for grabs, but I think this is the game. No disrespect to Italy, but I'd love to see him get that starting jersey and we'll see a far more confident player because the more games he gets under his belt we can see him constantly building and we do have to look ahead to that World Cup we've got to get these guys some game time I do always have a bit of sympathy for Johnny Sexton Leem in these conversations in that he's hardly going to walk up to Andy Farrell and say you know what Andy the best thing for Ireland is if you to leave me on the bench and give Joey a bit more game time I'm, I'm fine with missing a match against Italy that is not the character of any player uh, playing at that elite level but you do wonder what it would say to Joey Carber if having played and performed so well in France that Johnny Sexton just comes straight back in to a match that again the Ireland know they're going to win in all likelihood I, 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 I say this in tongue in cheek now Nathan it's, it's oftentimes hard to feel sorry for someone like Johnny Sexton with Lions tours test wins you know world player of the year Heineken Cups and all he's achieved I say that tongue in cheek of course I do and it really is hard to feel sorry for him in the sense I'm answering your question in a way that I think would best suit what Andy Farrell is trying to do. We haven't discussed how Andy Farrell sells this to both those players. So that's of crucial importance. And, you know, Reese Zamet, the, the electric winger for Wales, mm. has been sent home. Now, how in God's name Pivac sold that to him, I don't know. So someone might ask me, what do I think of that? And I said, I haven't a clue, because I've, no, I've no idea what that coach said to that player. And we probably so don't really... know that for three years when Joey Carberry is talking about the World Cup just gone and saying, well, actually, having played so well in France and not getting in against Italy, it killed my confidence. Or yeah, yeah, actually, I, yeah. knew, I had such a strong, positive conversation. I always knew where I was with Andy Farrell. Yeah, and that's really, and that, that brings a different layer of complex, complexity in their relationship. It brings a, a sense of trust. So in other words... Andy Farrell, I've met once or twice, I wouldn't know him. He strikes me as a phenomenal, like a, a top, top character. He strikes me as just a guy you'd, you'd die for, you go into the trenches for, and he has a cerebral ability, and he has the confidence he's brought a team of management around him. How he sells this big decision is really important. And it's not just that, that don't, that sell will go down through the team too, because I'm sure we'll talk about James Owen, we'll talk about other players, but it's really important. We will never get to understand that conversation but how that is sold is really really important and I think that Sexton at 36 will be as hungry as he was when he was 26 or even when he was 16 but I think there's a part of the role he's playing and you can see it already subtly in the evolution of this team he isn't as as important as he is he's less dominant and less important in the functionality of the team you see players like Tyke Furlong coming in Tyke Byrne coming up you can see Hugo Keenan at 15 who's barely a pup these guys, you can almost hear and see them and see them controlling. That has taken a little bit of a shift. So someone has controlled that and there has to be an ebb away from what maybe Sexton's domination along with, say, with the, with the previous coaching structure. So I think it's a good thing. But how the coach sells it is, is really important. That'd be an interesting one to get a fly in that role. And, and just to finish up then on the uh, never-ending Sexton-Carberry conversation, Fiona, uh, Andy Dunn was on last night and I think he was making the point that Johnny Sexton needs a Johnny Sexton putting pressure on him the way Johnny Sexton did on Ronan O'Gara. Does Carberry's performance put him in that position now that actually we are talking about him as a, a real alternative or are we still that there's a definite pecking order of Sexton being well ahead and Carberry just making sure that he's the best number two? 
I think there's a definite pecking order, but I think it's due to lack of game time and, you know, Carberry's injuries. Then we we're floating around a few other out halves. We were looking at Harry Byrne, where there's talk of Jack Carty. So I think Johnny is established because there's no one just grabbed that jersey and really challenged him just yet. But that game in France was a start for Carberry, and he really, he really said, I can take over here. I can put on a show also. So I think that pressure has come through. We all know Johnny, like he's got to have that competitive streak in him to be as good as he is. So he, there is no way he doesn't want to play in this game. He's putting his hand up saying, I can play. I'm fine. I'm injury free. Let me in there. Let me in there. And he knows he saw that game and he wants to say as a player, he wants to go out there. Obviously, he wants someone coming up after him, but he also wants to go out in this Italian game and reestablish himself and say, yeah, he was really good the last time, but I'm back here again and don't forget about me you are listening to the Six Nations show all our rugby and off the balls with thanks to Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us I'm joined by Liam Toland and Fiona Hayes uh, it doesn't seem from the various murmurings that are coming out of camp that there's going to be widespread changes to the Ireland team but there is obviously another enforced change as well Ronan Kelleher is out injured so there's going to be a, a change at hooker uh, the expectation seems to be that Dan Sheehan having come in off the bench and done well in Paris will get his first test start but Rob Herring's back in the mix Dave Heffernan's there as well Fiona what would be your choice? Dan Sheehan, he has to be rewarded for coming into that big cauldron in France. He just came on and, you know, he nailed those lineouts. I thought he was excellent around the park. Um, obviously, the scrum at the start maybe um, wasn't as settled when we lost, um, but there had been a few uh, penalties already. But I think Dan Sheehan has to be rewarded for, for, for going into that game and playing really, really well. I thought he he's like a he's like an old man, you know, head in the shoulders. He's a young guy, but he seems to know where to be. He interlinks well with that backline attack and he's carrying really really hard so I, I think I'm a big fan of hurrying at set piece but I think what Sheehan gives you around the park it's just that extra bit of zoom and I'm I'm really excited when I see him play with Leinster and I think he deserves to be in there this week Yeah Liam what is it that Andy Farrell seen in Dan Sheehan that seems to have him ahead of Rob Herring and Dave Heffernan It's, it's a little like uh, Mac Hansen you know they're playing at such a high level in, in their provinces and the, the style of rugby that they're playing in their provinces is, is, is equally as, as they can just flick they don't they just get resprayed into new colours called green well it's when they go back to the conduct of green and the, the blue of, of Leinster like it's not just that they're really good players but they're they're capable of when the coach says I want the Irish coach says I want you to play this way that that that's makes perfect sense to Dan Sheehan and it makes perfect sense to Hanson and that's a huge compliment to the to Connacht and all of that and the and the recent journey of Connacht obviously Hanson's a backstory but obviously uh Sheehan has his own backstory too so it's a huge compliment so I think just being able to fit in makes a huge thing uh in terms of Ireland deploy a one three two two system it changes around and that sort of stuff Sheehan seems very comfortable in that Sheehan seems comfortable across the width of the 70 meters he's obviously as Fiona has rightly said he's his, um, his darts were good. Scrummaging wise against France, like, you know, you know, from the, the day I started playing rugby, when you went out and played against any of the French sides, like, wow, you knew you were in the middle of something special when you went out to scrum time. So, like, the only way you could learn, and you won't get what he learned on a scrummaging machine, you know, the old days of a, of a cloud machine, you'll learn nothing on that, but you'll learn an awful lot in, in whatever an hour's rugby in, in Paris. Uh, I think the real question, though, is not hooker. We, ha we happen to have a decent bit of depth. You've got to start thinking about uh, tight head and, and loose head and the age profile of our players. I know Furlong is, is relatively young, but Kilcoyne was what, 33, uh, Porter's relatively young. So you, you're kind of saying the bigger question here is who should be starting these games in terms of game time with an eye? Now, that's why you kind of have to define this fixture. Like you got to win by 40 points mm. to give you a mm. shot at the championship. Uh, you've got to prepare with a huge eye on England. I know they won't say that, but obviously they have to. Then you have to get combinations right to allow that to happen. At the same time, you have to give certain people opportunities. And I know that if, if you were to be selected for Ireland at the weekend, Nathan, you'd say, oh, fantastic, I'd be delighted. But you'd immediately look at the other 14 players and you'd say, okay, who am I actually sharing this experience with? And that's really important because you, you want to be playing in the strongest Irish team possible. And that comes back to combinations. When you think of Lowry, does he get a run at full back? Well, then you're, there's a bit of chopping and changing. Now, we know in the Six Nations that this is the only fixture in the last 10, 20 years where there might be changes that aren't injury-related. 
This is the only time a bit of experimentation, but because of England coming up so quickly and because we're already trying to bait in a couple of players, I wouldn't expect a massive change, but I'd like to see Kilcoyne start, for example. I think Porter is phenomenal. Uh, Should you then start Kilcoyne, Sheehan and leave Furlong and bring Balaam in then at that stage? So you need to get that kind of who's going to finish the game, who's going to start the game. Where, I left Healy out, obviously. So you know, but well, I, I think I think it's a time for Kilcoyne maybe to to come in. You could you could leave Porter off altogether and have Healy start and Kilcoyne come on. That is that balance, Fiona, that yeah. that Andy Farrell looks for, and I think it's a really good point that Lee makes that you know widespread changes actually you don't learn that much because that's not a realistic thing that will happen against an England in a few weeks' time or at a World Cup. You might have one or two players you want to see how they slot in. That if you're coming into that team, you're coming into that front row. And you're Dan Sheehan you, you, you really want Ty Furlong there alongside you Ty Furlong you want him there alongside you all day every day you know he, what he brings is absolutely phenomenal but it, it's that it's it's making those few changes it's getting guys in you know you talked about Killer maybe coming in Healy is set, are set behind Porter on the bench but I'd be the same Liam I, I'd, I'd like to see David Kilcoyne getting on there he's 33 years of age now and you know he hasn't I suppose he hasn't been capped as much as as obviously Munster fans would like to have seen him being capped because the standard of front row at Leinster and has been absolutely exceptional prop wise but he's someone I think he could add value going forward and if if they're not if they're getting 10-15 minutes at the as a front row you come on together probably a lot of the time maybe there's three chains around the 55 60 mark so you're coming on with the guys that are on the bench as well you can call them game changers or whatever they want to be named nowadays but it would be good for him to get on and start with someone like Furlong and then you've Dan Sheehan so I, I'm, I'm definitely big on having those one or two key positions another one other like outside I think Hugo Keenan he's started 18 consecutive games now he's been absolutely outstanding we know what he can offer you know he probably he, this game time is really standing to him he's relatively new into the squad but he's someone who's we don't even talk about him he's that good you know he, week in week out he, he's putting in eight nine performances for us so that's an area I definitely love to see a, a change whether you stick with in your wingers um you know there's so many options there I know Andy Farrell in the past has obviously acknowledged that although he hasn't played with Connacht that Matt Hansen is is another guy who could slot into that fullback um thing we've talked what about, about Lowry, Joey Carberry was, Joey Carberry is another guy. A lot of people are big on that. I know um, Farrell mightn't see it that way, we, but it's definitely somewhere I'd love to see changes. Maybe a couple front row changes. You're looking at maybe a centre change and full back. I think this is the game it needs to happen. You know, we're, we all talk about summer tours as well. You, you've got three games over in New Zealand. If Ireland win the first game, are, is there going to be a lot of time for changes over there? You, you, you probably not because you're looking at maybe going over to New Zealand and winning a tour. That then becomes the focus so I think games like this in the Six Nation is like absolutely no disrespect to Italy but it's just on the back of the last the 33 nil loss to England I think this is a game where we could definitely afford to slot in a few guys who will perform Coombs maybe as well in the back row who will perform at that standard with the other guys around and pushing them on Yeah the depth conversation is interesting Liam because I think we're all guilty of looking at a squad and saying there's great depth there, particularly when the provinces are going well in Europe and we've watched the players go win matches. But actually, you know, real depth is that when you lose a player, somebody of very similar ability and experience can step in. And there are areas of the pitch, because Ty Furlong has been just so exceptional for so long. Understandably, nobody's been able to get a huge amount of game time. And likewise there, as Fiona touched upon, at full back with Hugo Keenan, like, you know, the conversation about Rob Carney's replacement didn't last very long because Hugo Keenan has slipped in there. But like Jordan Car- Larmer seems to have fallen out of the picture. He's still around the squad, but we don't talk about him very much anymore. Uh, Michael Lowry's in there. Like if Hugo Keenan picks up an injury, who is next in line? Is there depth there at full back? Actually, is there is there depth that we know will perform at a good level? Uh, well, I think with this game in mind, I think you could certainly start Carberry at 10 and bring him and switch him to 15 at a point in time. You could start Lowry. I think, like, you know, I, I, Lowry is just wonderful to watch. And again, he is the result of how Ulster plays his rugby. I have a feeling if he was playing in Munster at the moment, the way Munster play, he wouldn't be in the Irish squad because they wouldn't expose him. You know, the game plan wouldn't encourage him to play. And we would, we would be seeing a guy who might be struggling 
everyone has strengths and weaknesses. We might be seeing his weaknesses exposed and not ex- and not being exposed to his strengths. Uh, Bella Kuhn, for me, I think is an important guy to get started. So now we're back into the combination. So uh, if you're looking at the back three, I think James Lowe will be very important. To, to, to I don't know how fit the guy is, but if he's fit enough for selection, I think bringing him in adds an extra dimension to particularly his kicking game. Um, he has certainly transformed his work uh, ethic. And one of the things about Hansen that, that you know, we all look at the try he scored, but his work ethic off the ball, whether he's chase hunting hunting in a defensive role or an attacking role is is phenomenal. And you've got to say that. Now, there's a benchmark that the Andy Farley can say, listen, James, I'll just remind you, this is the work rate is, is expected of you. But his kicking game is important. And you can see what Italy are trying to do. They, they have in... Uh, Padovini at, at 15, a guy who's very comfortable as a second receiver. So Ireland have slowly kind of going towards that. But if you get someone like James Lowe, he's an advantage as a second receiver from a kicking point of view, which would be very important looking at the you know the likes of England in, 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 in Twickenham. Um, so how much of that back three, that's a potential complete change of the back three and whether Andy Farrell would, would go for that or not. But I'd love to see Bala Clum, I'd love to see uh, James Lowe, and I'd love to see Lowry. Now, whether the coach would go for all three, it's a, it is. But then again, the two boys are playing in Ulster. So, you know, they, they would have a relationship with them. Um, the depth then in, in, in second row, Nathan, is interesting because mm. um, like we had a debate the last day of uh, 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 Joe Malloy nearly had a quadruple heart attack when I was <laughs> suggesting that Ian Henderson should start in Paris because of the game, that the power game and all that sort of stuff. I know Henderson has got COVID now, so he's out of the fixture, isn't yeah. he? So, so I'd love to see Bard starting in the second row. I think he's much better second row than he is a back row. Uh, alongside Ryan, that Leinster combination. Then um, a couple of guys that... I found her, her unlucky in death. Ross Maloney, the second row for Leinster. I, I just don't know what, like, I think he's a super player and uh, I really enjoy watching him play and how he contributes t- t- to Leinster, but he's not part of the conversation. Treadwell is obviously in the Irish squad mm. when they get in, but I, I'd nearly go with Ryan and Bard in the second row. I'd go with Byrne possibly at six. Now, you could argue that Peter Manny should get a run there. Uh, and Josh van der Fleer, arguably should be given a rest. And that's a big call because Coombs, I agree with uh, Fiona Coombs, I think it'd be great to get him a start. But you've got an embarrassment of riches maybe. So at seven, it's kind of an interesting one because Jack O'Donoghue in in Munster has been playing super rugby. He's not in the Irish squad. It would be great if he could be fast-tracked, but that's not going to happen. So who then? And you've got guys around Leinster like Scott Penny and these guys who would be great to see. But within within then, Nick Timoney might get a run. Does Peter Mahoney get a start or is it a better opportunity to leave him on the bench, et cetera? So there are definitely great opportunities to get Bard in, to get like Bielam in, to get Lowry in and Balakluz, but how much more you want to dilute it, I'm not so sure. Well, well that's what I was just going to ask, Fiona. We've gone from uh, the uh, <laughs> conventional wisdom around the squad seems to be that it's not going to be a radical overhaul to actually changing the entire pack there in the space of about 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, Ian Henderson been ruled out with COVID as a... Uh, Unfortunate because it did seem that one of the potential options was that Henderson would come in and that would see Ty Byrne move to six and then potentially Caelan Doris playing at eight with Jack Conan being rested for this match. Maybe there's still a possibility of, of doing that as as uh, Liam said and putting Ryan Byrne into the second row. Is, is, is there anyone else that you look at there that you feel actually, even if they're only making a couple of changes, deserves an opportunity and can slot in? I think it's hard. The back row talent in this country, I was only talking to someone about it recently, is absolutely through the roof at the minute. It's so exciting. Um, you're talking about Jack O'Donoghue. He's got, like, how many player of the matches. He's not even nearly there. A lot of people are like, he's not as good as the guys up as, uh, up at camp and the guys that have been picked. And I totally agree with that at times because it's just, there's so many really, really good players. Someone, it depends what type of game you're looking at. If you're looking at that power game, I think Timoney is a good option to get in at six. I think he's he's an excellent work rate, but he's also a big, big ball carrier. And if you're putting him at six, I think you could maybe look at Doris or Coombs staying at eight. So I, I would be the same if I'd make maybe... 
one or two changes because you do want them to build up that um build up that repertoire with the other players and I think Van der Fleer although you know you might rest him I, I think he could do with another couple of games as well I know he's played a lot but I, I, I love that out and out seven and he gets around the park and I think he's another guy like Sexton who'd be like I'm fine put me under there's nothing wrong with me I don't need a rest so so I'd be just tweaking that beard maybe could come into the second row but I, I think on what I'm hearing from camp and from people talking he doesn't want to make those wholesale changes so I would imagine you're looking at two three most in the in the 15, uh, the starting 15. Mo- the move from 6 to 8 if it were to happen for Doris even as a one-off game uh, what does Doris bring differently uh, to Jack Conan in that position Liam? Well I, su- I suppose it kind of goes back to the, the French game you'd ask yourself what, what's the role of a second row what's the role of a back row and uh, you know there's a bit of old school in this but it's not too far old um, second rows in many ways their primary role is to provide quick ball for somebody else to use it <laughs> okay, line out is obvious, the scrummaging is obvious. But that means, for example, when one of the when one of the behemoth French second rows goes into the breakdown, you want your second row, maybe not necessarily to neutralize that, but you have he has to be big enough to, to occupy the space and get in the way and just physically impose himself. Uh, a back row is someone who creates opportunities. And a number eight, I would say, if I was coaching a kid who's like 10 or 12, and he says, Listen, what do you do? I'd say, wherever the ball is you should be pretty close to it, whether it's in the opposition's hands or in your hands. You should be influencing an awful lot. And if I if I had criticism of CJ Stander, it would be that he didn't influence enough. He was a he was a confrontational number eight, whereas Doris and Conan can do that, can go into heavy traffic. We saw what Doris did was the was the try against the All Blacks. Was that when he just tore through heavy traffic? Mm. So he can do all that, but he can do much, much more. And as a number eight, you have the ability then to start influencing and creating opportunities for others. And Jamie Eastlip was a guy who, who played against CJ Stander. I always argued that Eastlip created opportunities for other people. So you might see a winger score a try in four phases for something Eastlip did. And number eights need to have that footballing ability. Conan has it. We saw him uh, in the autumn series in the Lions test that he's comfortable across the pitch. He can carry the ball. He can carry in two hands. He can convert to three on two. He understands that. And Darius is the same. Both those players equally can can go into heavy traffic if necessary. I think Darius probably is a hybrid of all of those things because he has the physical confrontation. He picks really strong lines, but he has that nuance. And if memory serves, I might get my names wrong here, but when Ireland played Italy in Dublin during COVID, the autumn series or something, there was a try Hugo Keenan scored in the bottom left-hand corner. Italy were carrying the ball in, into the Irish 22. It spilled, and I think it was Darris who picked up the ball and immediately put a couple of passes on it, and Hugo Keenan scored. Those subtle things are enormously important if you've got a back row forward who can mix it but can do that at the same time, and he can do both. So he's, he's a super addition. And certainly, I think my overall sense is that... Andy Farrell will have to prioritise the players he wants to get pitch time. If it were me, I would be prioritising Carberry to get him back on the pitch. That doesn't mean he'll be playing against England. He has to prioritise other players, which means, for example, he might want to get Bard pitch time in the second row. That will have a knock-on effect that might suggest that, that Josh van der Fleer stays in the pitch. So we don't know what the coach's priority is on guys he wants to prepare for the coming bigger games that we're facing beyond the weekend. And I agree, I don't think there'll be massive change. So once he picks one, it will influence others. So Henshaw, I assume, will start, etc. That will limit then the other. But then he's not going to be changed because he's such a calibre player and such a, a focus anyway. I presume you're both expecting Ireland to hit that 40-point victory mark? Yeah, I, I would be expecting that. Um, as I said, I watched Italy against uh, England. I think um, Ireland play far more expansive rugby. You know, the Italians, their errors were, were were really, really high. I know they're, you know, I think the average age of the squad is 23. You know, Kieran Crowley's building something, but they're just not quite there yet. Um, I, I'm a big Garbisi fan. I think he can light it up at times. But just 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 with Ireland's power game, I think we'll absolutely dominate at set piece. And I and and with that interlinking moves out the back line and and how everyone's connecting really well with the multiple playmakers.
players on the pitch I would imagine it's going to be an Ireland at home as well that always adds to to the to the scoreboard I would think it'll be a, a 40 plus win for definite Liam I was struggling to find out exactly who was injured on in the Italian and who was possibly not going to be in selection I'm struggling so I don't have I, I've struggled to get an absolute accurate answer on that so until we see the team sheets and see who's missing uh, and I'll take what Fiona said there I think the criticism of Italy uh, leaving the Six Nations is complete. It's it's of such disrespect. It's it's ridiculous because if you analyze what Italian rugby are doing at underage level, the under 20s, now most people, casual viewers, will see Italy under 20s beat England under 20s. But the under 18s have been doing it. There's a, there's a crop of really talented players coming through. Uh, and I think it's hugely disrespectful to an awful lot of Italian players that are super players this is a new breed that's coming in and if anything they need patience and support and guidance and finance and all the other bits and bobs that come in it i think the challenge that they'll have is that they're not playing enough games at a high enough level to test them to fast track them and their their, their provinces or whatever you call them uh, are struggling for all the obvious reasons i think it's going to be a tough game for ireland i think it's a game that ireland should be aiming to get that to get certainly plus 30 on, on the scoreboard. But I'd be surprised if Ireland don't get there. I, sorry, I wouldn't be surprised if Ireland don't get there because there's an awful lot of improvements what Italy have achieved. They were ahead of France, what was it, 10-6 or something after 20 minutes. Mm. England struggled against Italy for an awful lot of time. The Italian defence has improved dramatically. The type of scores they're, they're conceding has, has shifted into a kind of a unit's the units, if Ireland get into a mauling game, I think that will certainly dominate them. But a swashbuckling performance cutting Italy open, with the caveat I haven't seen the team, I'd be surprised. It's going to be hard work to get to plus 30, I would say. All right. And just briefly on the other two games, then France still going for the Grand Slam, go to Murrayfield to play Scotland in the first game on Saturday. Uh, Gavin Villiers, who's been outstanding for France on the wing, misses out in this one through injury. Do you give Scotland any chance, Fiona, of doing us a favour? <laughs> <laughs> They've been a bit inconsistent, haven't they? You mm. know, after the, after the first game, I would have said, yeah, they're well capable, the Scottish, and they build themselves up, and you saw them beat England. Would you like, say that wow. Finn Russell is mercurial? <laughs> definitely. Definitely a phrase I would use. I mean, I love watching him. I love what he brings, but it's, it's, it's not always, is it? It's not always the exact same thing with Finn Russell. Um, they just disappointed me against Wales. I know they're at home in Murrayfield. We, you know, France are looking at that Grand Slam. They seem really, really focused. Um, I thought Ireland would have. I thought Ireland might have nicked it over in France, but it was just a, a powerful performance by them. So, so I'm not too sure if it can be done over in Murrayfield with that uh, last Scottish performance that I watched. And then England against Wales, Liam, 4.45, Twickenham. You mentioned Lewis rees uh, not going to be in the Wales squad for that game, released back to his club. England, having lost to Scotland in the first game, went on to beat Italy at 33-0. They've managed to Alagi and Courtney Laws back in the starting 15 to Alagi for Six Nations game in a couple of years. Is there a player that's as important to his team as Manu to Alagi is and how he can transform maybe the fortunes of England? Well, as an old coach of mine said, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And when you bring those two boys to anything, you're, you're coming in to see the guns of the Navarone. Those two boys make a massive difference because we saw against for Ireland against France how real power and pace can actually really upset the rhythms of what you're trying to achieve. And I think England, with those guys back, would give, like that's a super England side. Maybe not functioning the way you'd like, maybe a bit confused on tactics, maybe confused on its kicking game and its over-reliance the kicking game. But those two guys come in are game changers. Um, I see England winning this. Uh, uh, and although they have struggled in the championship thus far, in a sense, um, I see England winning this. And I think this is going to be a tough day for Wales. All right. Liam Toland, uh, Fiona Hayes, as always, thank you very much. Thanks, Take care. We will, of course, have full coverage of the Six Nations across the weekend on Off the Ball. We'll be reacting to the Ireland team on tomorrow night's show and then updates on the two games on Saturday. And then we will also have live reports throughout Sunday afternoon from the Aviva Stadium. The Six Nations Show on OTB Sports Radio. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team, we all belong to the team of us. It's spinning! It's spinning! Can you come on and talk about Ireland's attack shape? It's really exciting. Go on, Ireland! I've never seen a team like Ireland before. We all still think to this day that it's the right call and we're the ones out on the pitch. OTB Sports Radio.